I'm a fully grown human of average build and average strength. This is a tiny 125cc scooter engine that I cut in half. It is exactly 16 times smaller than a 2 liter 4 cylinder car engine. And now I'm going to use my average strength to try and open the valves of this engine. And although I am definitely able to do it, it takes a considerable amount of strength and effort to open the valve. It takes strength because to open the valve, I must compress the valve spring. I must overcome the resistance of the valve spring. The work and energy I put into compressing the spring is then stored in the spring. And once the camshaft lobe moves away, the spring decompresses and snaps the valve shut. Now I did this just a few times and I already feel strain in my hand, but the engine when running has to do this thousands of times every minute because we must open both the intake and the exhaust valve during every full combustion cycle to get air in and out of the engine, which means that to keep operating, to open the valves, the engine must consume some of the work that it does. It must consume some of the energy that it harnesses from combustion. In other words, the valve train is reducing the power output and the efficiency of the engine. But we don't really have a choice. Four-stroke engines, which is what 99% of the engines on the road are, they need to let air in during intake, the combustion chamber must be sealed during compression and combustion, and we must let air out during exhaust. This means that we need a system capable of sealing and unsealing the chamber thousands of times per minute while at the same time withstanding the incredibly harsh conditions present inside the combustion chamber. And that's exactly what poppet valves like this one actually do. They are great at sealing because the conical shape of the valve face fits into the conical shape of the valve seat and together they create what's known as a positive seal. They're also both made out of hardened metals which offer impressive resistance to wear and increased temperature. And as combustion pressure acts on the valve head, it actually pushes it harder against the countersunk seat. So the greater the pressure, the better the seal. Unfortunately, other than being great at sealing, the poppet valve has no other inherent advantages. You could even say that from an engineering perspective, this is just a necessary evil that we worked around with decades of technological advancements. The first thing that we had to solve is to get valve seats to even last a reasonable amount. Back in the 50s and 60s, the only way we could get valve seats to not fail very quickly was to put lead in the fuel. One of the reasons why we had leaded fuel was not just to prevent knock in the engine, it was also to prevent valve seat failure. It protected the valve seats because the intense hammering of the valve face against the valve seat under very high temperatures would lead to micro welds between the face and the seat. As the valve opened again, these micro welds would tear, eventually leading to valve seat recession, which is just another word for valve seat failure. The engine would lose compression, you needed a rebuild. Then, then we realized lead is bad for us, so we phased out leaded fuel, and engineers and manufacturers were forced to develop better materials and designs and manufacturing processes to actually get valves and seats to last a reasonable amount without lead. That was the first challenge we had to overcome. The next challenge was the valve spring. It too is a big problem because at high RPM, when you try to open and close the valves many, many, many times in a single second, the valve spring cannot keep up. It can simply not open and close that fast, that rapidly. So instead of full opening and full closure, you get something known as valve float. The valve just floats around the seat, which of course leads to a loss of performance or even worse in an interference engine. It leads to contact between the valve and the piston, which leads to a bent valve. Again, a loss of compression. You need an engine rebuilt. Uh, Ducati developed a very complex and maintenance-heavy dysmodromic system just to get rid of the valve spring. Koenigsegg developed the extremely complex free valve system just to get rid of the camshaft. But neither of these technologies ever became mainstream. 
in the mainstream, engineers persisted with the conventional valve and the conventional spring, the conventional valve train. They persisted, they pushed harder and they developed things better. We got better valve spring materials, better designs, and eventually we got engines that still had conventional valve springs, but they revved to the moon. They persisted even further and we got variable valve timing and lift control systems that can do pretty much anything that Koenigsegg's free valve can do. The valve remained and the conventional valve train remained and with a lot of effort we made it better and better. But there's something that no amount of technological development can resolve with the valve because it's an inherent problem in its shape. And that's that the valve, which is supposed to let air in and out of the engine, is actually an obstacle to airflow. It impedes and slows down the flow of gases in and out. Of the engine. Imagine you have a container A and a container B. Now imagine that you want to get the maximum amount of gases at the maximum speed from container A to container B. What kind of shape would you use? Well, both physics and common sense tell us that the best shape is a simple, straight, open ended tube. But unfortunately, with valves, we can kiss a straight tube goodbye. The shape of the valve means that instead of a straight tube, we have something like this. The gas must flow around the valve. It cannot go straight out through the tube. The aerodynamic shape of the valve does help to smoothen out the airflow, but still the gas must go around the valve. It must circumvent it to get in and out of the chamber. There is no denying the fact that gases would have a much easier time if the poppet valve simply wasn't there. But we got around this too. We created clever intake manifolds with variable lengths and clever resonances to ram the air past the valve. We created forced induction in the form of super and turbochargers to stuff more air into the chamber. We created long and complicated exhaust manifolds to help suck the exhaust gas out of the chamber. When you think about it, a lot of the development of the internal combustion engine has actually been an effort to work around the valve. When you observe a typical engine, you will see that a cylinder head together with the intake and the exhaust manifolds takes up more space than the heart of the engine, which is the engine block where the crankshaft, rods and pistons are. We need more space for the breathing equipment because valves make breathing hard. But what if, what if there was a better way? What if we simply got rid of the valve instead of trying to constantly work around? Of course, many engineers asked this very question over the years, and they did indeed come up with a bunch of alternatives. One of the more promising and more elegant ones is called a rotary valve. Instead of a poppet valve, valve seat, spring, retainer, rocker arm, lifter and camshaft, all we have is a rotating barrel with cavities. As the barrel rotates, the cavities line up with other cavities in the cylinder head to let air in and out of the engine. So what we actually have now is a straight, open-ended, obstructionless tube, which means dramatically improved airflow compared to a poppet valve, which means better performance and less need for complicated intake and exhaust manifolds. We also don't have valve springs, which means we're not wasting energy and compressing them, which means again, more power, more efficiency. Also, because there's no valve springs, there's no possibility for valve fault at any RPM, which means that achieving ridiculous RPM is much easier now. Also, this system, the rotary valve barrel system, is, is much more simple than a conventional valve train. It has a great reduced number of parts, which means uh, less complexity, less chance of failure, and also reduced engine size and weight. So the rotary valve is better than a conventional valve train in every way. Okay. So where is it then? If it's better in every way, why have, been, why have we been using the poppet valve for the past 100 years and not the rotary valve barrel? Well, that's because the rotary valve is better than the poppet in everything except one thing. And that one thing is sealing. It is difficult to achieve a good seal with a rotary valve arrangement like this one, but it's not impossible. It is difficult because to seal, the rotary valve barrel must either rotate inside a round seal 
or rotate together with some sort of o-ring and then the o-ring will seal against some sort of casing. We have plenty of o-rings and round seals in every engine, for example, the, the crankshaft and the camshaft ends, they rotate in round seals, but there's an issue. None of the parts that have round or rubber o-rings and round seals on them, none of them are exposed directly to combustion heat, but a rotary valve barrel is, because it's exposed directly to combustion heat, it expands a lot more. Now, the problem with expansion is that a round seal, a rolling, a rubber round seal needs very tight tolerances to operate. When the part expands, maintaining these tolerances becomes very hard and then the seals either fail or wear much faster than we want to. But as I said, it's not impossible to do it and in fact, it has been done. A man by the name of Ralph Watson has built and operated an engine with a, similar, with a system very similar to the one I'm showing you here, successfully and raced it successfully since 1989. Now what Mr. Watson did is that he made a custom rotary valve system for a British BSA 90 degree V-twin engine. His system employs conventional material O-rings, together with wavy rings, additional bronze seals, and spring-loaded levers to ensure that the O-rings perform as they should during engine operation and that the valve remains sealed. The rotary barrel sits on oiled bearings and has overall proven itself as an effective and reliable system. As I said, this engine has been used and raced extensively for several decades. In fact, the, the, the project is so good that it outlived Ralph Watson himself. The, the car, the BSA Special, now has a new owner. So although this is not some sort of uh, mass-produced, daily-driven application, it is still very valuable because it's a obvious proof of concept that rotary valve technology can work and can be employed in practice. But what we also have now uh, is an ambition to take rotary valve technology into the mainstream, into mass production. And this ambition comes in the form uh, of a company called Vastec from uh, North Carolina in the United States. In fact, the animation I've been showing you is from Vastec's website. The company is composed largely of ex-GM engine developers who want to take this, this technology into mass production. Uh, and their design is a rotary valve barrel with cavities similar to Ralph Watson's. There are differences in sealing, but the big difference is that uh, Vastex cylinder head no longer has any oil in it. Their design does not need oil in the cylinder head. In fact, all the oil now stays in the engine block. They have patented a rotary valve sealing system that consists of upper and lower valve seals together with gland gaskets, thrust washers, and support bearings. And they have presented their concept on a conference of the Japanese Society of Automotive Engineers in 2022, where they won an award for their paper. Here you can see the comparison of required parts between the Vastic system and an equivalent 50cc power equipment engine. As you can see, the Vastic cylinder head requires less than half the parts. At this time, they have goals to introduce the technology to small handheld engines and power equipment, but aim to expand to vehicular applications in the future. So overall sounds very promising, right? Rotary valves, many benefits. So are we going to see it in the next decade? Maybe two? Is it going to happen? Well, maybe. Uh, it is promising. The benefits are undeniable, but uh, the timing is not ideal. We have two obstacles for rotary valves becoming mainstream in the near future. The first obstacle is that many industries are now going through a, let's say, a love affair with electrification and whether that love affair actually turns into a marriage, only time will tell. But the love affair does, to an extent, impede large-scale investments into combustion technology. The other issue is that many major important combustion technology uh, manufacturers and developers have spent insane amounts of research and development into the conventional puppet valve train. So they want to see a return on their investment, which means that they preferably want to keep selling the conventional valve train for as long as possible. So the timing is not ideal, despite the benefits. Speaking of the benefits, are there any drawbacks other than the ceiling? Well, there are two minor ones that I can notice from a superficial examination of 
internet material because I never had anything in my hands. Uh, the first drawback, a little one, is that the size of the rotary valve barrel and its proximity to the combustion chamber means that it might be difficult to locate a spark plug right in the center of the chamber. As you can see on uh, Vastex, uh, a little CAD drawing, the spark plug, spark plug is on the side. It also might be difficult to find space for a direct injector because the barrel takes up a lot of space. Whether this will be true for larger engines which larger, with larger combustion chambers, I don't really know, just something to keep in mind. The other small uh, drawback that I noticed, and this is from the BSA special Ralph Watson's car, we can see traces of combustion around on the underside of the valve. And this is because the rotary valve cavity is not sealed against the combustion chamber. We are only sealing the sides of the barrel. So some of the combustion gas, some of the combustion energy escapes out the chamber and goes into the little tiny space which is around the valve. This is a very small volume, but it is still a little loss of energy and thus a little loss of efficiency. It's probably a very small loss, which is far outweighed by the elimination of valve springs and camshafts and whatnot. But again, something to keep in mind. Uh, there's also a little benefit when you think about camshafts and rotary valves. The rotary valve barrel is just rotating, just like a camshaft. And it's also driven by a timing belt or timing chain, just like a camshaft, which means that we can take a variable valve timing gear and attach it to the rotary valve barrel and get variable valve timing using existing technology very easily. So a nice, convenient little benefit. So I guess that's pretty much it. A, definitely a promising technology. Um, with its little challenges in terms of sealing and the timing for it isn't ideal, but it's still, regardless whether it happens in the next decade or two or not, it is still worth knowing about because it serves as a very nice demonstration of the shortcomings of the ubiquitous puppet valve. So that's pretty much it. As always, thanks a lot for watching. I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.